introduction here, I'm from Intentional Software. And we're creating a tool for supporting DSL development. Uh, and uh, in this talk I'll be talking about uh, a DSL I created using our tooling for the financial industry, for creating financial reports. And um, I would say that in the previous talk we saw uh, a lot of, of focus on the DSL itself and how it looks and so on. And uh, my talk will be focusing more on the tooling we created around uh, our DSL in question because that is kind of the, the uh, more the thing that stands out basically about this project. So uh, we'll be talking about the DSL of course, otherwise we have nothing to hang our hat on so to speak. But um, we will be focusing on looking at, at how we support the DSL for people who use it. The idea behind this this DSL is to create financial reports, basically. And um, a financial report, uh, from the limited perspective, I'm not a financial guy, of course, I'm a DSL guy, but, but I understand the domain when I'm thrown into it. And in, in this case, it seems that the financial reports um, were created based on different data sources. Um, there could be a standard thing was to have a bunch of Excel documents and maybe some relational database tables <coughs> from which you would kind of gather your data and then you would maybe massage the data a little bit and then you wanted to put it in some kind of output format, a report that you wanted to uh, be able to define what that report looks like. And in the case here, the financial experts, the domain experts in this case, knew very well uh, where they wanted to take their data from and they knew very well how they wanted the reports to look. But their as this situation was that they would then have to sit down with the IT department and explain all this to them, which is a lengthy process, as, as we all know. So we tried to create a, to a DSL, but where uh, the main kicker here is the tooling around the DSL that would allow these financial experts, rather than just IT people, to define how to bring in the data, define how to show it in reports, define the layout for such reports, and be able to go basically from, from data to report in reality obviously involving the IT people to some extent but also to some extent doing a lot of the work themselves. So um, seeing this uh, we uh, divided the, uh, well, the, the workbench which is what we call these, these toolings around the DSLs uh, into two parts or, or we had two separate DSLs that kind of marry, marry together here where the first DSL is about data it's about bringing in all the data that they need for the reports they can augment that with data that they actually just fill out manually if they like uh, sometimes descriptions and things like that are, are easy to just type into the system instead of having to create some new Excel file type it in there and map it in so um, we can bring in data and we can just type in data in the data section and mix the two of course and then the second DSL is about producing documents. So that DSL is mostly about defining a layout, but it also contains a DSL for accessing the data from the data DSL. So uh, the document DSL has knowledge about the data DSL, not the other way around. So the first thing a, DS, uh, a financial expert would do in this uh, system would be to start looking at the data they want to import. That's, that's like the first step. So we'll take a look here on the data section where we see something that looks more like an application perhaps than a standard DSL editor, but this is a DSL. So the, the strong suit about our tool is that it allows you to create an editor for your DSL that doesn't necessarily look like just code, like if you're in Eclipse or something like that. We can create an editor for the DSL that does look like code if you want to, but we can also create something that uses more like a tables and, and things that look like maybe a Word document in the, in the basic presentation structure. So what we have here is something that looks decently nice, but it is a DSL editor in fact. And what we have here is the ability to define data types, such as a fund, or if I collapse here we have fund performance, we have uh, countries, <coughs> and um, in this demo that's all we have really and then um, we can also define data sources so here we have defined an Excel file where we say that uh, it, it maps to this particular file in the file system that we want to import from we can create relational databases and say how they should map and so on and then we create 
the data type for uh, the data that we're interested in from that Excel document. And this particular Excel document has like more than 100 columns, but we're not interested in all of them. So we just, in this data type for the imported data, we just create a few properties that we are in, interested in, and then we say over here which column in the Excel sheet we want to map to. And it's simple as that, really. And it allows us to import the data from that one and to marry it or, or resolve it with references to these other guys as well. Because as we import the data, when we run this thing, we can, there's a button somewhere around here, we're actually doing the importation. Um, I refresh data from Excel, now we just bring it in. And uh, as we do so, the data is kind of in, in two main categories. One is primitive data that we just take in. But the other thing is when we have references from one thing to another. For example, countries here uh, reference uh, a list of countries that we have as a separate data type. So uh, we want to be able to associate a country in this data type, basically just a list of, of names and their flags and so on, and the uh, fund performances taking in from this Excel file. And this is done automatically, so when we give the right data type and so on. So uh, what we have here is something that, as we do the importation of data, kind of fills the role of an object relational mapping framework in that it also resolves all the relationships between this. So this is a fully uh, resolved data structure that you'll be working against uh, in the end where uh, all the pointers between the data works. And we also have lists of things. So it's more of an object-oriented data structure uh, that we're working with here, even though it looks tabular. So uh, we keep that in mind. We keep in mind the fact that we have references that can work and that we can later navigate over. And we have lists that we can loop over in this data here. And um, I'll have to keep this quick because the time is short. So we'll go on to look at the next BSL, which is about producing the documents themselves. So here we create a document type because we can, of course, produce for a monthly report, of course, we create the document type once and then we just uh, generate a new report each month with a new, a new data part, of course. So what we do is we create, for example, a fund report document type here. And we can provide parameters to this document type. And uh, in a simplistic scenario, these parameters could be... Well, okay, let's take it in a three-step approach. In a super simplistic scenario, these parameters you would just fill out the values for them right here as you create a new instance of the document. We'll see later uh, when we do so, um, skipping ahead here, here, here is an actual instance of a document and you fill out the parameter values for the document. And one approach is to simply fill out the whole thing, which is what we do here for the portfolio commentary, for example. But another um, better approach is to enter values that um, actually map back up to the data section. And so the most simplistic is to just have values you fill out right away in the properties. The second most simplistic is to have pointers to the actual data, but to uh, say that the, you need a lot of parameters if you need a lot of values. So for example, say that you want the, the first name and last name of a person uh, responsible for the fund or something like that to go in here and you had to create two parameters for it for the doc in the document. That's kind of the second step. But the final step which is nice is when you in fact just have a person parameter which takes a reference to a person up in the data structure and then that person has the first name, last name, initials, what have you, titles and then you can just start working with his data inside the document when you have a pointer to him from the parameters. So we have defined the parameters and we go on to define the actual template. And this is, again, what you see here is what we consider a DSL. Even though it's a DSL that is A, very declarative, and also kind of WYSIWYG style. So we create things like, uh, like um, uh, uh, sections, and uh, we can assign things like background colors if they stretch out or the sizes for them and things like that. Uh, simply by clicking them and editing uh, parameters for them. And mixing in into this, we can add references to our parameter or parameters. So we saw that we had a parameter here called fund, for example. And if we put in a reference to that here, it gets a back, yellow background, so we see it's a reference to one of the parameters. And then we can start, as I said then, 
working against the data of that found, a fund up in the data section, what has been the, the properties that has been defined for it. So a fund has a title and name, for example. And we use here um, a notation that says uh, possessive apostrophe s, but that's just uh, syntactic sugar. It's the same thing as a dot notation in standard OO. So if you were programming Java, this would just be fund.title and fund.name. We think this looks nicer for a business expert to say funds title and funds name, things like that. But you can navigate over the data structure and even in multiple steps. So you might have, let's see if we have examples of that here. Yeah, a, a certain country's Excel data, then we navigate from the country up to the stuff we imported for, from Excel from that for that country, and to one of the columns there. They have a bunch of columns called the AME, APO, shape. Maybe some of you actually know what that stuff means, I don't. But it's, it's a, um, a, a kind of two-step navigation, as you see here. In, in NOAA, this would have been country.excel.data.ami like this. And sim uh, in, in a similar way, we can iterate over a list. So, for example, a fund has year performances, which is a list of, of values that we actually import from the Excel spreadsheet, those are the one we import. So we import multiple rows in the spreadsheet for a certain country. So we get that result, that association, and we can iterate over the list associated with a certain country in the code here. And so you see that there's a mix of this templating language saying how, to, how things should look in the report, and adding a little language like this one that allows you to do things like create variables, as we do here, we create a new variable called alt, give the type boolean, start to sit out as true. And then we can do things like looping over a list here. For each perf, we call it, of type fund performance in the year performances, we do the following thing. We check if the uh, perf's YTD, whatever that is, is lower than zero. If so, we type out this row where it's hard to see a little bit, but it gets a red background to indicate that something is bad with that line. Otherwise, if things are good, we check if is, is this an odd if it's all this true, it is first time, then we do a white background, otherwise we do a gray background, so we have alternating colors in the, in the output. And then we, of course, assign odd with not odd, we, we switch the value of odd. So we have these basically three languages, the data language, the kind of templating language, and the little language for accessing the data and iterating over values and so on and working with it. That little language also has a few financial specific things like rounding and so on associated with it. And the result, when you put this together, is that you create a new fund report here. You fill out the values, where some of the values can be a lot of text that's actually associated with this very report. Uh, and that something is just a reference to, for example, a country that has all the fund uh, rows associated with it. Or a, a country and a fund, like this. And the result, when you fill in the, uh, when the, fill in the parameters like this, is a financial report that looks using the template they have specified like this. And you can see that we get alternating white and, and gray lines here. And you can also see that we can put in just graphics, if you like, inside the parameters, and it will just show up. Um, we can see that um, if we have, I think this second example, yes, here, we have one where the uh, this one, YTD, is lower than zero, and so we get the red background line. So we can kind of mix in a little bit of business logic as well in this templating language. And this kind of gives an overview. I don't know, when did I start and when should I end? Uh, you have uh, 10, 15 minutes. Probably about 10 minutes. And we'll take questions. 10 minutes left. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, including questions? Yeah. Ex yeah. Excluding questions. It's about, yeah, I don't know if the clock We should start going over to questions actually because I think this can, I, can, I can speak a lot more actually about this but I would like to see if there are questions at the moment. Yes, please. How do you think this compares to um, Antler? Uh, to Antler? Um, you mean our tooling or this particular DSL setup? Well, Antler generates the DSL, so um, there's quite a lot of graphical tools around Antler now. Yeah. Quite well, there is there's one big difference, which is that this is a projectional editor, whereas Antler is entirely grammar text-based. And so one thing is that we don't have to well, that's a very nice thing. With a projection editor, as is, we don't have to care about grammar at all. We don't have to define one, which is uh, taking a load of anyone's back. But it gives something more interesting, which is combinability very easily of 
different T cells. So you can keep them small and separated and then start combining them. Which is a problem with textual D cells because if you have like the same keyword defined in two languages, you suddenly have a clash that you really need to create a third language in order to resolve. This gets hairy quickly and Marcus Felter has written a really good book on D cell engineering where he, he gets fairly deeply into this problem in textual languages. That problem is simply gone in a projectional editor where every node in the tree has been resolved. If it's a reference to something else, it's a reference to the global unique identifier associated with the node rather than a reference using the keyword as a string, so to speak. So we don't really care what the keyword says. We can change that afterwards. We can have the same keyword in different languages without real collisions and so on. So that's one, one big difference is that we can much easier combine these languages. Second big difference is that even though they're adding graphical uh, components, I would argue that our graphical uh, projection of our DSLs is really our strong suit. So I think we can do more than they can and it's also easier to create it. Because all I need to do in order to create a projection, actually that's one of the things I wanted to do was go and look a bit at the code for, for this uh, particular workbench. And the code here is written as a C1 program, we call it. That's our DSL for, for writing DSL tools. <laughs> where the first thing is the domain deck, where we define the schema for our new language, the data and the uh, document languages. Um, and then we have transformations here and there. But we also have projections then for our uh, languages, which provides these graphical editors. And writing such a projection is, uh, well, just expanding the domain deck first, we'll see that we don't have to create a grammar, we just create Defs telling you what, what things there are, and field defs saying what kind of fields each thing has uh, to, to sort of child things under. And once you do that, you're, you're done basically. You can start editing and everything, and there's a default projection that allows you to start working with your language. But then you provide a projection down here uh, for, for your different uh, concepts in your language. And this is done in an easy declarative style using an abstract notation domain that we provide with two. So if we look at, for example, um, oh, let's, let's find something a little more simple. I mean, this one is, let's see, which is more simple. This one, for example. So we want to project a plus, minus, multiplication, or division sign, which is a concept in the language. We just used the abstract notation for a binary operator that's provided with our stuff. And just say that we want uh, the main field of the plus minus molar div, that's the thing that contains the left and right operation in, in one single field. To go under the main field of the A bin op, we should say that the symbol is taken from the definition of this thing, and then it will project accordingly out in the, in the editor. And this is a simplistic example, but let's look at something that looks more interesting, like the for each here. Let's see, oh, now we're, we, we've factored out the code into a class there, but let's see, a table maybe, yeah. Here you see a lot of code, but it's not that bad, and, and it's uh, mostly the declarative parts that are interesting. We use something called an A table. That's something that's already there. So you can think of it um, not entirely unlike uh, creating an HTML page <coughs> in this thing. It's like our, our abstract notation uh, concepts, kind of like uh, tags in HTML. But with the difference that when we put out a reference to one of the fields we have in our DSL, the mapping is done automatically, so uh, it's easier to see up here in the... Uh, let's take the plus again. We have this reference back to the main field, which is part of the definition of the plus and minus and so on. And all we have to do is put a reference to our field, and the mapping is done automatically by the two. So we just have to provide a declarative, uh, kind of like in, in my DSL there, where we should show the template for the financial stuff, this is the same pattern here again. We just say the character what we want it to look like, we just point out where the data should go in that template, and we're done, basically. And the whole editing experience is, is done automatically for us. So that's kind of really our strong suit, is the ease with which we can create these um, projections for our DSLs, which are attractive to business users to actually work with. Yes, sir. How do you handle uh, pagination? Uh, either a graph won't fit on a page, or you want to make sure it doesn't get split across yeah, pages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have, we have, we don't handle pagination inside the editor here. So while you're editing, you don't have a concept of pagination. But when we print out, uh, that's separated into pages. So when you actually print the report, the pagination is automatic, though. And uh, so, do you have configurable rules for the pagination? We, we don't at the moment, but it's not impossible to get there. Um, 
we can do it to some extent but because this language here the steel one language is an extension of C-sharp and anything you can do in C-sharp you can in fact do in this language here so since you can actually hack pretty low level to the printer, printer drivers and so on yeah we could do that the next step if we do that two times would be to create a little DSL for that and then we would actually be up and running on that part but at the moment no Yes, so just one, one more question. Uh, uh, we have seen here in this example access to an Excel file. Yeah. So, so, uh, is this available out of the box or, or you add some no. kind of uh, driver? I did. Because tomorrow yes. I want to read some kind of uh, yeah. uh, text file I have. Exactly. How is it done? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I used the, the, the .NET uh, uh, libraries for accessing the Excel file. But once I have done that, in fact, I created a DSL for defining you know, the name of the Excel file, the uh, columns you want to import and so on. This DSL is highly reusable. I've already yeah. reused it in other projects that just needed to import from Excel. So I just wrote that once really and it's, it's very So, so it's a kind of foreign function importing yeah, it is. into the, the system. Yeah, exactly. And then you can reuse it. And, and yeah. I could write my own import of some specific uh, exactly. text file. Yeah. Okay. Exactly right. And then you could very likely reuse that yeah. in many other projects. Exactly. Since you are running on a .NET stack, um, what do you view sort of the ideal interaction between a company's .NET developers or interface developers uh, working in those languages as compared to people working on the workbench, such as the business experts? So I guess I think it's very similar to the standard approach where you take your geniuses, you make them create some DSLs, and you consume those DSLs. That's that's really the, the approach I would say, because this. Seal one language, not only can you write seal C sharp stuff in here, you can directly just load one uh, a .NET assembly someone has written and you can start calling to the methods in it. Okay. I'm just jumping to the uh, So I guess your competition here is people creating the, the business users creating a Word document and then having fields there and then the developers coming in yeah. with VBA. Exactly. And so what would you tell the company that's doing that? to convince them to switch to this framework? Or? Well, there are a few things. I mean, the, the starting point is very similar. I'm not sure to what extent, because I haven't researched it li lately, I just implemented this stuff, but I don't think they have this full hour mapping support for the data importation phase, where they actually resolve things and create lists and so on from it. I don't think so. I also don't think they have a similarly easy uh, little language for accessing that data and, and navigating around in it like this. Uh, I don't think that their language for creating the templates is entirely so simple as this one, but it's getting there. It's, it's reasonably simple. So there are a lot of similarities. I would say that the big difference is that we bring this together in just one tool in one view that's mm -hmm. easy to use and where everything is resolved. So if I, for example, look at the font title here, I can do F12, which is follow reference, and I get directly to the definition of that thing up in the data model and so on. Which um, I think that, that, that the coherence of the whole thing is, is one, one big thing that stands out. And secondly, that you really don't need to program anymore. I mean, that such a solution would still involve a VBA programmer to some extent. You really don't need that at this point. Is there some notion of version control or other things? That there is. Really there is built in into our uh, basic system. So for any DSL you create the tooling for, there's built in version control that builds on, on the node level. And it's not text based. Again, it's projection based or, or tree based, which means that every node in, in this, this it's in fact a projection of a big tree, underlying data structure for everything here is a big tree. And each node in the tree has a unique identifier, a GUID, as I said, which means you can keep track of it in a better way than you can with a text thing, where in a text, if you create, uh, if you rename a class, that looks to a standard version control system as a delete and an addition, whereas we can keep track of that was in fact a rename because the underlying UE was never changed. So we can even improve the, the uh, version management, and it should be added, we have a plugin for both Subversion and for Git that brings uh, that, that gives you a merge and the diffs using your actual projection. So you get two versions of this with red and green stuff spread around it to show the differences. And how have uh, business users, have they understood that? I guess, I don't know. Oh my god, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think they, ex they understand it to some extent, but I wouldn't set them up working with it. <laughs> I, I think that's that's probably better to risk. But that's another thing as well. In our version control system, which is very different, this thing, from most others, you can in fact check in a conflict. 
normally you will actually have to resolve a conflict before you can check in your code. But here you can just check in a conflict because in a tree there is no com there is no problem with having two alternative child nodes saying these are alternatives to the child node. You can just check that in, and the next guy who's an expert in conflict resolution, he can go in there, inspect, say, oh, this is what we need to do, delete one of them or, or whatever. Which means that the business user can't be made aware that he has created a conflict because red is showing up. Check that in, send an email to the genius goes in and inspects it and, and fixes the problem. I feel like the genius may not like this workflow. It's kind of overloaded that poor guy, yeah. <laughs> but there, there is always someone who, who has you know, the technical business expertise in the company to do these things. And it's almost always the case that you kind of get dependent on a few guys for, for those special scenarios of, of fixing errors and so on. So the idea is not to get completely independent of the IT guys. It's to be able to do more of the stuff yourself. Any more questions? Go ahead and thanks, Mats. Thank you very much.